All right, welcome to week four. Um, as of today's lecture, it'll be everything that is needed for the midterm exam. So that's the good news. Uh, the other part of the good news is uh, now that I was able to get into my account after they reset all the teacher's passwords and I couldn't change it from remote and magically my old password started working again. Who knows? Um, we, uh, I realized that half today's slideshow wasn't needed for the midterm. So I'm going to split it in half. So I'm going to cover what's needed for the midterm today. And then I'll do the second half next week. Because next week's supposed to be review for the midterm. And honestly, it doesn't take two hours to review three and a half slideshows. So, yeah, no. Um, so we're going to go through that. Um, Lab 2's drop dead is tonight. After tonight, you can no longer submit. Lab 3 is due next week. Theoretically, Lab 4 is due. Well, Lab 3 is actually due tonight with a drop dead of next week. And Lab 4 is due next week with a drop dead of the week after. But I wouldn't recommend waiting that long to do Lab 4 considering this content from Lab 4 on the exam. So, um, without further... I might as well get through today's slideshow. And is it going to work? Not work? Oh, we're working. Okay. Uh, today's happy topic is Linux user management. Um, it's a really important thing. This applies to actually pretty much all operating systems, the concepts. Uh, these are specific to Linux and or Unix and uh, Mac to some extent. The commands are similar in Mac land on Mac server, not Mac desktop. There was such a thing as a Mac server, or there was. Um, now, when a user logs in, whoever they log in as determines what they're allowed to do. And at the, by the same token, it also determines what groups they're part of. And the groups also determine what they're allowed to do. Remember last week I talked about permissions? And there was like the owner's permissions, the group's permissions, and the permissions for everybody else? Well, that's what gets applied when you log in, is it builds up all the groups you belong to so you can apply a mask to everything you, you do when you interact with the file system. Um, when a user is created on the system, it creates an entry for them in the password file. And it looks vaguely like that, but I'm actually going to pull it up in my terminal so you can actually see what it actually looks like. which looks like complete noise. It really does. But it, the thing is that each line is the important ones. So if you look at each line, you'll see that you have, um, if I use this one right here, this looks similar to what you guys have been playing with. It, deter it, it displays the person's username, uh, their group IDs, their user ID, their nice description, a few other fields, uh, their home path, and then their default shell. So theoretically, you can modify user here and change their shell by changing this file. You got to be careful when you play in this file, though, that you don't really break it. So you're better off using the proper tools to make the changes in here. Now, as I was saying, the first field is login name. Second field is a password field. Uh, if you, when you look at it, you'll see an X right here. This is saying that the password is held elsewhere. There's a file called Shadow, which I'll show you guys in a minute, and it contains the encrypted version of your password. There once was a time where the password was stored in the password file. Right? PassWD, password file. And then uh, a lot of people started putting in, uh, figuring out how to exploit less than secure servers, and they just started ripping passwords. I know this was a time where the password file was actually really easy to decrypt. The passwords weren't very well encrypted. And it was, you know, crazily easy to change a password. Because you could actually go in there and just delete the password and then you can log in as the person. Magic. Um, the third field is the user ID. That's the magic number that represents you um, or your or the user in the system. Uh, you can think of this almost like a primary key database. Hopefully you guys know what that is. Huh. 
If you don't know what a primary key is in a database by now, you probably should go back to term one, considering you're taking database a second time. Um, however, every person has a unique ID. There's also a main group ID. So when you first create your user, it creates a group ID. And normally, it just to your user ID. Not, but depending on what's been done with the system, they may get out of sync. But essentially, every time you create a new user, you have a user ID and their primary group. So here at the college, for example, your primary group would be student. My primary group is staff. So that's how it is. Uh, in a Linux system, your primary group would be you. And then anything else gets added on after the fact. Uh, field number five is other info or comment. Uh, could be all kinds of information, such as your real name or an office number, that kind of stuff. Uh, the default home directory for the user. Where is your home directory? Uh, and then the default shell for the user. So when you log in, what's the default shell you're going to run in? Most of the time, if it's uh, Ubuntu, it'll be Bash. Now, this file, which I've now pulled up in VI, so it's nice and color-coded, is usually only editable by root. Nobody else has permissions to touch this file. Why do you think that is? Because you shouldn't let anybody else touch the file. That's why. It's, there's no magical reason why it's there. It's, it's well, the second most important file in there as far as security is concerned, after the encrypted password file, which is known as the shadow file. If that file gets corrupted, nobody can log in. So really you shouldn't be letting you know, Bob, Dick, and Harry make changes in there unless they actually know what they're doing. And unless they have root, they probably don't know what they're doing. So, um, However, anybody can look at it. Why? Because you need people to see the contents of the file to actually be able to log in. So part of the login process actually looks at the content of this file and then it determines what your groups are. If you don't, if you can't see it, that means it can't log in, thus the system doesn't know who you are. It doesn't know what your default uh, shell is, it doesn't know what your home folder is, it doesn't know any of that. So you can't get in. Um, you are able to change things that apply to you directly such as your password. But usually when you change your password, it modifies the shadow file anyways, but you have to use the appropriate utility and the utility temporarily gives you permissions to modify that one little thing. So it's a bit like in Windows where you want to change your password to get into Windows. You know, you use the control, delete, change password, you change your password. You don't get to go hack the SAM files. You use the utility that makes the changes for you. And it's the same thing on Linux, where you have to use specific tools to make changes to users. Um, and very few tools, actually, can you use if you're not a super user. Password is an example of one of them. Um, okay, this is what the shadow file looks like. <coughs> There's not a whole lot in here other than you see a username, then a big pile of gobbledygook, and then a bit more information. The big pile of gobbledygook is your password in an encrypted format. One-way encryption, by the way. Can't be decrypted. It's a hash, not a pa not an encrypted password. Um, when the ones you see with a star means those users do not have a password. Thus, they cannot be logged in as, unless you give them a password. All right, so here's the contents of the shadow file, which I just had up on the screen. I guess I'll pull it back up just for entertainment purposes. All right, so here's a shadow file. The first field, because it's all colon delimited, is the user. The next field is your encrypted password. Um, 
if there is an exclamation mark, it means the password is disabled or there's no password. The star means something else. Uh, but essentially, you can't log in as that person. Um, the last one is the last time the password was changed. So when we look at this file, um, right here, is last time the password was changed. And, hold on, nope, this one here, sorry. That's the last time the password was changed. So that's how many days since Epoch? And just so you know, Epoch is January 1st, 1970. That's when they decided to start tracking time on a computer and everybody had to agree that this was the start time. So January 1st, 1970, the number of days since. So it knows how many days since then your password has changed. So if there's password rules saying you must change your password every 30 days, it uses that date because it knows how many days since 1970 it is now and it looks at the date in your password and the shadow file. And if it's more than 30 days, you've got to change your password or more than 40 days or 45 days, that kind of stuff. The next one is the num minimum number of days between password changes. So how many days do you have left? Uh, before your maximum number of days is allowed to be valid. So here at the college, you know, for example, they have an interesting password policy. I have to change my password every seven months. Why such an arbitrary time frame? I don't know but it's every seven months. Uh, you know, so I don't know what they have to set for students, how often you guys have changed your passwords, but it sucks in general. Um, the next one is warning. How many days before your password is set to expire should the system warn you your password is about to expire? It's kind of good to know that, you know, your password is about to expire because unlike uh, like a Windows domain where if your password expires, you can still log in to change your password where you, know, you log in, it prompts you for a new password, and then you put in a new password to continue. Uh, on Linux, if your password has expired, your password has expired. And then you have to ask an admin to reset your password for you. So it's a little rougher. Uh, inactive. So number of days after the password expired that the account is automatically disabled. So by default, even though you can't get in, you can still have uh, the admin reset your password for you, but if you don't ask for help inside, say, 30 days, it nukes your account. That doesn't nuke it completely, it just makes it usable until an admin re-enables everything and all that jazz. The expiry is the last field you have at the end. So, right now you can see that more, everything on my version of Linux is empty over here. So, i got to make sure I line these up right. So that'd be number of inactive. And then the last one is uh, the expiry. In theory, you can set... Oh, darn. You can set an expiry date on the account. So in that file, you can say this account will expire on this day. And after this day, it will no longer work. So for example, you're hired on as a co-op student somewhere. And your first day is... May 15th, your last day is August 25th. When they create your account, they may actually set your account to expire on August 25th. So when you leave, the administrators don't need to remember to go reset your account. It just stops working. We do the same at work with our Windows domain. When we hire high school students or uh, the odd time we take co-ops or interns, which is not very often, but it's been known to happen, we set expiries saying your term ends this date, your account dies the next day, so you can't log in and keep using us for your email. So you can't impersonate where you work <laughs> if you can't get into your email. And, you know, it's important things to know. So those are the two major files when it comes to for user behavior. Um, and there's a few commands that really are useful if you're root. Um, the first one is user add. Let's create a new user. And User add is funny because there's also a, f a command called add user. Add user is a, is a script that does a bunch of different steps while it prompts you. User is the manual. Well, you got to provide all the appropriate uh, pieces of information. So a few important parameters. Dash D, define the user's home directory. 
believe it or not, you don't have to have the person's director under slash home. You could actually have it on some other part of the director so that, you know, or you could actually have um, a home folder, but you could actually have a home folder for each department. So each, you know, each department has different subfolders. So maybe you want to put each department on a different hard drive. So you'd have different mounts. And each user goes to a different drive. So if you got a server with three drives, and we'll use Windows as the example for because you guys used to drive letters. Let's say you have drive D, E, and F. You could actually put some users on E, some on E, if you wanted with this. Um, dash G is the initial group name. So if you create a user and you insist on setting his initial group, the group must exist first. So when you create a user, you could actually add a user and add them to the root user group. So that user basically is root. Even though they're not root. But you could make them be root for all intents and purposes. Uh, dash capital G. If you want to add them to more than one group, so you've got the primary group and you want to add them to a couple of other groups as you go. For example, when you create a new user and you want to add them to the sudo group right off the bat so they can use sudo, you'd add it with a dash capital G. That's magic. Uh, dash C is for comments. So you want to add a person's name? Dash C. Uh, dash N is uh, don't create a group with the same as the username. So what it does is it adds them to the existing um, group called users. So if you go dash n, it doesn't create their user. It puts them. It doesn't create a group just for them. It creates. It adds them to the existing users group. Dash e set the expiry. Dash s is set the login shell. And you got to give the whole path to the shell. You can't just say dash s bash. You have to go slash bin slash bash. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And uh, a few other ones is create the home directory if it does not exist. And when you guys go to do lab oh, 08 or uh, eight, somewhere, I think it's 9 or 10, uh, the first mistake most people do is they forget the dash M argument. Once you look at those labs, when you get to see those labs, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, it's usually the biggest mistake they do. Um, and then if you do user add dash D, it shows you the defaults. So if I did this and it shows here are the defaults. So when you create a user and you don't pass any of these arguments, these are the things it uses as a default. It'll use bin sh as their shell, um, it, no expiry date, um, not inactive, their home directory is somewhere under home and they belong to group 100, which is the users group. So if you don't supply any of the other arguments, this is what it uses as its base. Oh, and the last one is create mail spool equals no. That means do you create a user for them in, their, in the built-in mail system as Linux, which is useless. So nobody uses it. So now, when you don't use a dash D, user add will create a new user. And I'm going to create a, my first user here to show you guys. So I'm going to go user add dash D. So I'm going to create a home folder called Bob. I have to tell it that I absolutely want to create the home folder. If you don't push the dash N, it's going to just not do it. It'll set the home folder for the user in the chat and the you know in the uh, password file, but it won't create the directory. So you know, you create a user, tell them their home is here, but their house isn't built yet. If you want the you know real world example. Um, I'm going to add them to the pseudo group because I want to add them to the pseudo, gr pseudo group, but I'm still going to let it create his own default group because why not? And, and the username is actually going to be Frank. Frank's home is Bob because, you know, why not? 
No, it happened. And uh, as there's always in Linux land, if you made no mistakes, it doesn't tell you you did a good job. I'll let you into another secret. Let's say you forget to create the home directory. You're still allowed to do that too, so it's no longer going to tell you a mistake. It's just going to create a user that doesn't have a home directory, or not a valid home directory. All right, so if I go look at my home directories, you can see there's the Bob folder that I created, like the user Bob, like the home directory called Bob, but it's owned by Frank because actually the user is Frank. Right, so I created a home directory called Bob, and but uh, actually, whoop, one more, like this. Home directory is Bob, uh, but the owner is Frank. So, you know, the home directory does not need to match the person's username. Now, those are the big ones. So, I'm going to go show you guys what happened inside. Um, so, you'll see right at the bottom. There's Frank and Frank 2. In actual fact, I did something stupid during my example. I used the same home folder. So I got two people sharing the same home folder. They're cohabitating. Co roommates. Except one of the permissions to get in the house. <laughs> you know, Frank 2 is not allowed to go see Frank 1. Because he doesn't have a key to get into the house. But, you know, stupid stuff you can do. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, you can see it created two groups, 1001, 1002, homes are set. Um, I didn't set the default shell, therefore these users are going to use the default system shell, which is sh, not bash. Um, and if I look at the contents of the shadow file, you'll see Frank exclamation mark because the password is never set. Frank can't actually log in because Frank doesn't have a password yet. Kind of sucks, right? Can't get in. Uh, same thing with Frank too, he can't get in either. If I were to do Now you can see I changed Frank's password, now he has a password in there. Big long line of gobbledygook right over here. All right, so the next one we have is user Dell. If we user add adds a user, user Dell gets rid of a user. And if you use user Dell and you don't, dash r is the best argument, it removes the user's home directory. If you don't include dash r, the directory stays behind. So, I'm going to use my two users I created, including the ones I created by mistake, because this is perfect for the example. So if I go user Dell, Frank, not Frank2, Frank, see, it blinked. If I look in here, the Bob folder still exists. But now it's owned by just numbers. Why? Because Frank doesn't exist anymore. So that folder is actually orphaned. It's owned by someone that no longer exists. But if I do dash r and I try to do Frank 2, still can't delete it because it's not owned by Frank 2. So the dash R is powerful, but they won't remove things that doesn't belong to the person. Sort of like, you know, you get someone eliminated, but you can't eliminate their house because, well, you don't own that house. If you want to use a slightly morbid approach. Just going to add, uh, I'm going to add Frank 3 and Bob 2. So you can see here's my Frank 3 is there and my Bob 2 folder is there. I'm going to use a user delete on this guy. Okay, like that. And I do 
this, and now you can see that his folder went away. I created a user, I created his folder, but this time I removed the user with the parameter saying take out the guy's home directory. And you will notice one other thing. You'll see this fantastic message right here. This is saying that Frank 3 never received a single piece of uh, system mail. Because all Linux machines have built-in system mail. So you, I, the root user can email any other user on the system directly and they get a message in their inbox. It's not like your email, you know, 123gmail.com, it's built-in system mail. And, you know, on some Linux systems, the system mail maps out to an actual real email address, but nowadays nobody uses the system mail because they use stuff like, you know, Office 365 or Google or, you know, insert, you know, other stuff here like Yahoo, if you're, if you're an idiot. You know, if you, don't, if you don't care about the security on your account, then you use Yahoo. Yes? Um, what happened is, originally I created a user called uh, Frank. And, oh, why did it include both of them? Um, that's a good question. I'll go find out. I'm going to recreate that user. Frank 3 is set to 1001. It's reusing user IDs. Little risky. It's another risk. Um, thanks for reminding me because I, I almost always forget that, that part of it. Um, because that's something you don't see in Windows ever. Uh, so when you create a user, it looks at the most, the highest available user space ID, which is in the thousands. And it, it gives you the first available one. So my user right here is set at 1,000. So the next available one would be 1,001. And you end up with, since Bob, the original Bob was owned by 1,001, it was, even though it's not the same user, it gave him permission. So when I nuked the user, it didn't nuke the original Bob folder because that's not his official folder you can see right here where this is his official folder right so it'll delete that folder but it won't delete the other folder the, that he owns it doesn't delete all the folders you own it just deletes the ones that are spe specified in the file good catch um, huh. why the heck is that in the middle there okay we're going to skip that slide as I said, I normally review these slideshows on my lunch break, but I couldn't get in today because they were having password issues. Um, but uh, the next one we're going to talk about is user mod. Um, user mod allows you to modify users. Now, those of you that I helped fix your Ubuntu 18 installs, you probably saw me issue the user mod command. When I was adding your numeric user to uh, the sudo file, I did the user mod um, dash g to allow you to add to you know a specific group. All right, so user mod lets you do a bunch of things. Uh, specifically, it lets you change all the entries in the password file without you having actually to know what the columns are. Uh, dash c allows you to add comments. So once again, you can set a person's nice name using the dash c. Uh, dash d. You can change their home directory. Let's say you made a mistake. And you have two copies of the Bob folder, like I do now, Bob and Bob2. And really, it should have been, no, the first Bob. <coughs> it allows you to change it. If you include the dash M parameter, it'll create it for you. So, You'll see now that there's a Frank 3 folder, and it's owned by Frank 3. Bob 2 is gone, because I nuked his directory. 
And if I were to cat the password file, you'll see it changed its home directory in here too. Right there. All right. There's dash lowercase g, which is change the initial group. Dash g is change your additional groups. Um, if, well, the problem is when you use dash g is it will not only give you permissions to a group, it will also remove you from additional groups. So if you list the person, say, there's another part of a group called mail, a group called print, and uh, I don't know, some other group, and you go and you modify them so he's allowed to use sudo, and you forget to include mail, well, they won't be allowed to use stuff for mail anymore. You have to specify all their groups. It replaces their groups. It doesn't add one in or take one out. It actually really rewrites the whole group section. Um, dash s changes the login shell. So if you don't want to use bash, you can make them use a ZSH or CSH or just straight up SH or bash2 or bash reborn. Um, there are a bunch of them. Um, e, you can set the expiry date. So if I modify Frank3, that low KC, and I go 2019 0131. You'll see the last line, this is Frank. And this is when the person's ex account expires. So number of days since 1970, which is that, because I created him to, so he was created on 17-9-26, and he expires on 17-9-27. He gets 24 hour day access, 24 hour access to the system. After midnight tomorrow, he can no longer log in. It's like magic. You can change the login name. Not that I recommend doing it, but you're totally welcome to try. So let's say I want to change Frank 3 to become Frank. You know, we turfed Frank 1 and Frank 2 disappeared, never saw him again, so now he's the only Frank. There's no point calling him Frank 3 anymore, so we just call him Frank. Now, if I were to go here, now Frank 3 is now Frank. And if I look at the home directories, something strange happened. You'll see that Frank 3 directory, right? Because that's what it was called, is now owned by Frank. But the group is still Frank 3. Because I didn't change Frank's group, main group. And if I were to go. Here, you'll see that it's still group 1001 because I never renamed the group. And in a few slides, I'll be showing you guys how to deal with the groups. Um, dash L is to disable or lock a password. That means the person's unable to log in. Their password is toast. A bit like what they did to us, to all the teachers today at the school. They nuked all our passwords. And then dash U. Your passwords are now re-enabled. Congratulations. So you can turn people on and off with a simple command. God, oh, that's weird. Man, this slide shows a mess. All right. CHSH. You know how I could use user mod to change their default shell? I can also use basically change shell, C-H-S-H. -H. Right? And you can use that to change their shell. Um, and if a shell is not specified, it'll prompt you, as in which shell do you want to use. So if I were to go
you know? It'll say, hey, which shell do you want to use? So now I could go... Oh, really? There, done. And if I were to go back into this one here, you'll notice that Frank's shell has changed to bin bash instead of just being empty, default shell. There's not that much to say to that one. All right, so the next thing is uh, Linux groups. Now, groups is a system way, is a simple way to actually let people belong to more than one group of people. So if you need to give permissions to various parts to different people, then that's what you'd use as a group. So anybody here ever work for a fairly large organization? Anybody? You don't need to be shy, you know, it's like, whatever. So, you work for the man, yay. Uh, or a man, or many men. Or many women, let's not be sexist, I guess. Let's gotta be careful when we use that. Uh, trying to use old terminology there. Um, but usually when you work in a large organization, uh, different departments are allowed to see different things. For example, people in sales are not allowed to see source code. I don't, the sales monkeys touching source code, it's not a good idea. Their job is to talk on the phone and convince people to buy crap. Um, just like you shouldn't trust engineers with financials to let them go and process credit cards. Engineers get sneaky. They try to buy themselves stuff. They'd be surprised. I've seen some interesting things over the years. I've, to have to, I've had to do some pretty interesting audits. That's what databases are for. Um, you know, different departments are allowed to see different things. Same thing, we don't want the tech support guys touching the source code, and you also don't want the tech support guys touching the accounting. Um, but you might want the tech support guys be able to sales department, so see what orders were placed and what shipped and what person bought. Otherwise, what's the point of having tech support if they can't actually find out what you have? Makes sense. So what happens is you give people, you create groups, and you give different permissions to different groups, and a person can belong to more than one group. For example, um, someone in, in software engineering could also belong to the tech support group so they can actually see all the tech support tickets. So they belong to, you know, engineering and tech support. Somebody in accounting would probably be in accounting and sales. Somebody in sales would be in sales because you don't want those guys touching anything. You want tech support and tech support and sales because so they can see what the sales guys are promising. Um, that kind of thing. So you can overlap permissions. And then there's like global groups that everybody should belong to. For example, mail. Um, although nowadays it's getting a little more dis detached because there's, you know, third party mail systems that people are using like Office 365 or, you know, Google or whatever, Yahoo. Never use Yahoo for business. Um, but there used to be a time where if you want to let people access the mail system, you'd actually have to add them to a group called mail. Why? Because they wouldn't be able to access it. They didn't belong to mail. So you have a user. Their typical groupings could be um, their own group, right, by default, because they belong to themselves. They could belong to sales, to mail, to maybe file share, so they can access the system file shares. And each, and each of those groups define certain parts of the system they're allowed to touch. And it adjusts their permissions based on their groups to what they're allowed to look at on the file system. And that's what groups are for. Um, if you ever take any kind of server administration or network administration, not networking administration, but network administration as in, you know, managing users and groups, you'll learn all about that. Uh, if you really want to have fun with it, install with Windows Server on your machine and a VM and knock yourself out, see how fast you can lock yourself out. The, my average, uh, the average amount of time for once people start playing with their users is usually 15 minutes and then they have to reset the system. Once you start adding and removing yourself from groups, then you nuke yourself. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things. The, usually who plays with groups is system administrators. You as a user should not be allowed to give yourself permission to access. Imagine as a student you were allowed to add yourself to the college financials group. Oh, look at this. I can now go look at what, how, how much money they made last month at the college. Oh, look at that. There's a shortfall. Again. Because, you know, they cut tuition. 
And, you know, insert other reasons here. So the only people allowed to add you and remove you from a group or to create groups are administrators. Makes sense. And just like there's a password file, there's a group file. And there's also a G shadow file. Um, it's slightly different. Uh, the group file will ha list uh, the group name, the ID, and who belongs in it. So the group name is the name of the group. Surprise. Password. Theoretically, you can actually password lock groups. So you can add someone to a group, but they have to know the password to be able to access the resources that group has access to. So let's say you create a folder, and it's only accessible to the sales group. Before you can go into that folder, it'll actually, you actually have to, it'll actually ask you for the group password to get in. So you can sit there and go, CD sales, oh no, you're not allowed to go in there, provide password, kind of thing. And away you go. So it's for what they call privileged groups, so groups that have a little extra horsepower under their belt, or so if you could add people to a privileged groups that allows them to use sudo. Uh, not that you want to let people use sudo, but, you know, you could. Um, the group ID. Again, that's just a number that identifies the group, primary key for the uh, the group. Uh, the group list. So this is the list of people that belong in that group. So if I were to pull up my groups file. Duh. Like such. And in here, you'll see various groups, and you'll see my user, which is numeric. For example, ADM, syslog, and my user uh, username. S uh, ADM is the administration group. Surprise. Uh, CD-ROM. Sudo. My user and Frank belongs to sudo, because I gave him. I added him to sudo, as you know, one of my examples earlier. So Frank belongs to sudo. And, you know, there's a lots, of, lots and lots of groups in here. And you can see that for the Frank 3 group there, and there's no one that belongs to it anymore. And the G shadow file has a group, an encrypted password, comma separated list of administrators, and then a comma separated list of group members. So when you create a group and you set a password on it, you can determine that users A, B, and C are administrators of that group, and users D, E, and F are just regular users. So you could actually have a group administrator being able to add and remove users, but without needing administrator privileges. They can modify their own group, and only their group. But at least they can modify the group. And they can also make themselves no longer administrator of the group by accident. All right. Now, when you create a user, it creates an initial group, and normally it's set to whatever you want them to be. To be so, most of the time, it creates their own user group, so that you know you could add. Let's say you're on a system and you got three people on the system, and you can add each other to each other's. Group. So you could add her to your group, and he could add you to his group but he couldn't be in her group if you wanted. So you guys could share files, and then you guys could share files, but you guys can't share files. Right? So that's an example of what you can do, as in you can add each other to groups, right? You can share files amongst each other if you want. Um, by default, you get a default user, and your initial GID, the initial group ID, is stored in the back file. Uh, but because a user can belong to more than one group, it's also listed in there. But the initial group is the group it uses to start with. And the commands are fairly straightforward. Group add adds a group. There's no arguments. Group del deletes a group. Again, there's no arguments. It's not like the one where you can tell to delete the guy's home directory because the groups don't have home directories. Group add, it's not going to create a home directory because, once again, groups don't have home directories. Groups is just a group of people. Just like you can say, everybody who lives in Carlington, they all belong to the Carlton, Carlington group. The group, does, the that group doesn't own any of the houses. It's just everybody there is part of that group. Group mod. You're allowed to modify a group. And the number of parameters is uh, astounding. You can change the group ID and the group name. 
Um, if you want to see what groups you currently belong to, you can run the groups and you can do it without being root. But you can also feed in a username. I'm logged in as root, so I belong to root. Wow, amazing. So if I go... My user belongs to all those groups. The big difference between being part of the group, the root user group, and every, all the other groups is when you're part of root, you're part of root. You don't need any of the others because you're root. Being part of the root group is the same thing as being root, essentially. Um, new group essentially changes the group ID to a new group if they already belong to one during the login session. That means you can temporarily change your primary group. So let's say you're in as a regular user, but you want to be a privileged user and you're part of the privileged user group. You can go new group, and let's call it, you call it privileged, enter. <coughs> if a password is set, It'll prompt you for a password. Now you become an elevated user. G password is used to administer the groups and the G shadow file, just like you got the passwd command to change your password if you're a user, and you got user mod to modify. A, you know pretty much everything about a user. They decided to consolidate all the group stuff under one command: G passwd. And essentially with that, you can determine who a group administrator is by the A-A. -A. Um, you can also add or delete members. Uh, you can remove group password. And you can change the ID. Um, hold on. There's definitely a command missing on there. Oh, that's what they did with the slides. So you define the group administrator, and you can also add members and remove members. So you can add yourself an administrator, or add someone as an administrator, then they can go and add mem and remove members. And you can also take off the password. Um, you can define the password with one of the arguments, which is what I'm missing in here, is the argument to set the password. And even if no password on the group, so I created a privileged group, but there's no password on it. it you know, let's say, no. He's part of the privileged group, but she's not part of the privileged group. He can still new group himself into the privileged group, but she couldn't put herself in the privileged group because she doesn't belong to it in the first place. So even if you don't have a password, it won't let you hijack another group. You know, only if you belong to the group already are you allowed to go into it. All right. ID specifies all the information about that user. Uh, let me go. All right. So it shows your user ID. It shows your primary group ID. And every other group you belong to. Including and including their uh, group ID number. So Force for Admin 24 CD-ROM. Believe it or not, there once was a time you needed a special group to access the CD-ROM on a Linux system. If you weren't part of CD-ROM, you can actually look at the contents of a CD. And it was a common bug that they didn't set you up by that by default. And you wondered why you couldn't look at the CDs. You inserted CD to install software and you couldn't actually look at it because you weren't allowed to see it. Um, plug dev is, you know, plugging in USB devices. You're not part of that group. You're not allowed to see plug plugged in flash drives. You know, uh, LP admin, printer admin. And Samba Share is whether or not you're allowed to file share with other people. So like, you know how you can share folders on Windows with other people? You need permission to actually create shares under your own folder. If you don't have that right, you're not allowed to give yourself shares. All right. SU. You've seen me use SU already. SU is switch user. Once I thought it was called, it meant super user, but you know. So I was re-educated really quickly at one point when I said that in front of a Unix admin and he laughed at me. Uh, SU means switch user. It allows you to switch from one user to the other. And uh, how many in here have started in on Lab 4? So you've experienced the whole SU, 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 right? Jump, jump, jump. And after a while, you don't even know who you are. 
until you ask, who am I? Um, so basically put what it does is it opens up a subshell. So you're currently logged in a shell, right? So So my root user is in a shell. Yay. Now I'm going to become this user. As you've noticed, if I'm root, I can become any other user, and it doesn't ask me for a password. Because root is root, and he can do whatever he wants. Um, and what it does is it creates a shell dedicated to it. So that means you are in a separate sub-process. So let's say you decide to impersonate someone else. It's not that you pretend to be them. You actually literally become them. But you're them while you're still you. It's a little special. Um, now, unless you're root, you have to have the password for the other user. So if let's say I'm user 1 and I want to become user 2, if I go SU space user 2 and I'm not root, it will prompt me for user 2's password. So you can't just take over somebody else's account unless you're either a super user or you know their password. But if you're already a super user, who cares if you know the person's password, right? So uh, not a lot of people actually use SU that way. Um, dash D. I mean, it's just the dash, sorry, not dash D, just dash. Dash means not only will you become that person, you will become that person even more. It sounds dumb saying it like that, but that's literally what's happening. Is when you just go SU, it doesn't run their initialization scripts. So it doesn't set any defaults, any environment variables, any of their home directories, uh, their, their aliases that they may have set for themselves, all that stuff. If you include the dash, it sets all that. So you literally become that person with their habits and their knowledge. When you just SU without it, then you just become that person, but you don't really know, you know, you don't have any of their, their, their settings set up in your shell. So it's all your own settings and all your own environment variables, but you're impersonating someone else. If you use the dash, you literally become that other person. And if you use the dash, it, the, you have to put spaces around it. As some of you have discovered, it, Linux really cares. So if you go SU, you actually have to have the space. Like that. It's a bit of a strange looking command, but the space, because otherwise it thinks it's one command, it'll think it's SU dash A66037, not SU become this person 66037. Yeah. Pardon me? No, when I became that, I'm, I'm logged in as root on my system. Root does not need to know the person's password. However, so I'm in as that person now. You can see the prompt changed, right, to A whatever. If I go, I can't become myself again because I don't know the password. It, it literally it emulates the other person to that point where you now are that person as far as the system is concerned. So that means you, you need to know the root's password, which is... All right, so now I'm root again. So I'm root, but I'm also A66037, but I'm also root. That's the history of the shell right now. See, I'm root. Now I'm this guy. I'm root again. So... When you're playing with SQ, you can actually lose track of who you are after a while. When you start jumping from one user to the other user to the other user, and um, it's not often that you have to jump from one user to another user to another user to another user, but it does happen, and you tend to forget who you are at some point. And um, which isn't listed here, but you saw me type in the command, right? Who am I? All in one word. Which is, tell, literally tells you who, who you are logged in as at that moment. Uh, so, quick summary. Uh, user add as a user. User develop removes a user. Pass WD sets the password. User mod lets all the information about the user account except their password. 
Uh, groups shows the groups for a user or yourself. Group add, group del. Well, those are pretty obvious. Uh, new group allows you to swap user you're currently logged in. Um, Gpass WD sets allows you to set group administration and group passwords. And ID, which lets you see who you are and what you are, and all that jazz. Okay, so now for the the additionally important stuff. Um, the additionally important stuff is, as of that last slide, that covers everything that's on the midterm. Just so you know. It's not the review. It was the last set of slides. So it covers, as of now, the last item on the, that's on the, the exam, now uh, the midterm. Uh, the midterm is 40 questions, multiple guests, on Brightspace, if Brightspace is working that day. We're hoping it is, and cooperating. Um, it is technically not open book, just so you know. Um, I will be patrolling the room from the back because you're on your freaking laptops. So it's going to be really hard. So it's a bit of an honor system involved here with that. Um, but that having been said, uh, I will be patrolling. And if I see you switching back and forth, you know, there'll be problems. I also happen to know what the Discord group is. So don't try using Discord. I'm not stupid. I know what it is. I also know what it sounds like. And I've been known to fail entire groups of students for using chat programs during tests. So considering everybody's in the same room and I hear Discord go off, <laughs> that's not going to be a good day for you or me. Because uh, I have to justify why I failed everybody in the room. Because I can't prove who it is that was on it. Therefore, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of group punishment, but I can do it if I have to. So don't use chat programs. Your phones are not on the desk. Just so you know, so you, have, you, know, what, so you know what's coming down the pipe. Um, yeah, it's not open book. But I mean, this is literally memorization. It's not like the database exams where you actually had to understand something. This one is literally memorize the first four slideshows and you're good to go. Um, well, it sounds like a lot of information, but once you take out all the, the extra explanations in the slideshows, you'll see that, you know, user add dash m creates their home directory. <laughs> you know, as long as you know what the arguments are for, you'll be fine. Uh, as long as you know what, you know, ls dash l or ls dash a does, you're okay. It's not, or you know what the command is to add a user. That's the kind of questions you're going to get on there. Um, so, like I said earlier, next week I'm going to cover the second half of this slideshow because there's really, I don't like putting in content in a lecture for stuff that will be on the exam. Like, I like to cut clean so that you guys know mentally that it ended right here. Um, but I'll cover the second half of the slideshow next week and I'll, we'll be doing a quick uh, Q&A session. So if anybody doesn't understand something, we'll go through it and we'll probably do a few examples on the screen. Um, I'm also going to release sample example exam questions so you guys can practice a sample exam. That's not the exact same questions. Don't get your hopes up. But it's, you know, somewhat similar. Um, other than that, we're where we're supposed to be. Today's lecture was exactly one hour on the nose. Um, so, let me just, oh, sorry, I lied, 58 minutes.